Bien. Graphic, graphic designer and former theater lyricist. He has created more than 50 multimedia presentations on musical theater subjects with his own original graphics, which is presented all around the country. He has been profiled in the Chicago Tribune and interviewed on WGN Radio. He is a longtime favorite of Chicago Devo audiences. Please help me welcome Charles Troy. Thank you so much, Francine. And uh, thank you everybody for coming. I'm delighted with this, uh, the quantity of participants that I see at the bottom of my screen. Uh, I'm coming to you from my basement rec room in Mundelein, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Uh, and um, I, during the pandemic, I turned all these presentations that Fran described into videos. That's what I'm going to be playing for you. This was conceived as a two act presentation with live music. So uh, we don't have the live music, but we've got recorded music and we still have it in two acts which means that at the end of act one, and you'll know very clearly when that is, I will uh, stop my screen share, just chat for a minute or two, maybe about the books behind me. Then I will resume with act two. At the end of act two, I would be delighted if anybody who wants to would comment, ask questions, whatever. But it's about an hour and a half presentation with my very brief two minute um, intermission speech. So I think I should start right now. I see we're up to 90, but I am going to get started. So I will mute myself, stop my video and start my screen share and off we go. Well, it says the home regular is free. Here we go.
many popular art forms can trace their origins to a specific time and place? Yiddish theater can. Today we'll learn about this moment of pure inspiration, then how Yiddish theater quickly spread across the Western Hemisphere, capturing the passion of the populace as it rapidly flowered into a golden age, a flowering that would last but a few short decades and carry the seeds of its own destruction. It's an amazing story full of twists and turns that are, like Yiddish theater itself, sometimes outrageous, sometimes poignant, but always melodramatic. And like Yiddish theater, we're going to squeeze all these episodes, all these emotions, into one packed program, the whole Megillah, punctuated by klezmer music that mirrors the soul of a vibrant but distant era. Romania 1876. Yassi, a large city in the northeast corner of the country and a mecca for progressive Jews. One evening, into the Green Tree, a wine bar that offered entertainment, wandered a man named Abraham Goldfaden. I use wandered advisedly. Goldfaden was an artist in search of an audience, a writer of poems and songs. Born in Russia, he had traveled around that country and then to Vienna seeking his destiny without success. Now, at the age of 36, he was trying the most cosmopolitan city in Romania. Purposefully, he strode to the center of the stage. The place was packed, but whether with people or wild animals, I can't say. Instead of the usual comedian with tattered shoes and stockings to his knees, the audience beheld an elegant gentleman, a man with a serious air that commanded respect. In a deep silence, I began my well-known poem, Dus Pintala Yid, I recite slowly, ecstatically. They hold their breath. I end. I bow. Silence. The silence would have been all right, but when I go off, I hear whistles, hisses. Goldfaden had misjudged his audience. He was determined not to let that happen again. I'll pick up the story by quoting Stefan Kanfer in his invaluable book on the history of Yiddish theater, Stardust Lost. That night he lay in bed trying to figure out what had gone wrong, and then it came to him. Hard-working Jews had come to the green tree to be amused, to forget their tribulations for a few hours. And what had he given them? Moral instructions, history lessons. No wonder they replied with catcalls. Diversions they wanted, diversions they would get. We want shun. We want shun. Goldfaden stayed up all night and the next day writing an Italian style comic farce in Yiddish, a real hodgepodge, he recalled later. But when it was staged on October 5, 1876, the audience went nuts. And thus Goldfaden finally discovered his true calling, writing Shund for the theater. All right already, so what Shund? A Yiddish word that didn't make the cut, not one of those in common use in English. When I use a Yiddish word in the course of my narration, and I'll use many, let me tell you, I'll define it courtesy of either Leo Rostin's landmark book, The Joys of Yiddish, or one of several websites featuring Yiddish definitions. In this case, here's what an online dictionary says. The Yiddish theater presented everything from Shakespeare to Shund, the Yiddish word for trash. There was a constant struggle in the Jewish community between the advocates of edification and theater and those who just wanted to be entertained with plenty of contempt by the former for the latter, which was pungently expressed in the word shund. At any event, Goldfaden, now a man possessed, gathered an acting troupe, kept writing new material, and left Yassi to play other provincial cities with unpronounceable names, making cuts and changes as he went based on audience reaction. In essence, he was conducting out-of-town tryouts until he felt he was ready for the big time, which in Romania meant the capital, Bucharest. One of his new farces was named Schmendrick for the title character, a boring yeshiva student trying to woo an attractive girl who avoids him like the plague. He ends up with a homely girl who is even duller than he. 
Another farce was entitled The Fanatic. It's about a stuttering pedant whom Goldfaden named Kuni Lemel. The plot. The lead character is confused when his rival for the heroine's hand appears on Kuni Lemel's wedding day and convinces the dolt that he, the rival, is really Kuni Lemel, and the prospective groom should change places with him and let him marry the girl instead. Schmendrick, Kuni Lemel. Goldfaden had coined just what the Yiddish language desperately needed, two synonyms for idiot. As Alan Lewis Rickman points out in his hilarious play about Yiddish theater, The Essence, you know how the Eskimos have dozens of words for snow and the French language is full of words for romance? Well, Yiddish has lots of ways to say imbecile. I won't go into the significance of that. That's a doctoral thesis. But Goldfaden didn't completely abandon his serious side, which had gotten him booed off the stage in Yassi. For an 1880 play, he wrote a lullaby that became the most well-known Yiddish song ever. In Raisins and Almonds, a mother serenades her baby with her dreams for him, which seem curious now, but were so typical of poor Jewish parents then, that selling a product, in this case raisins and almonds, would make him rich. Yes, it's a strange lullaby, but a wonderful window into the values of Jewish culture of the time. For several generations thereafter, many Jewish men became highly successful by finding a product that became their business, their pride, and their destiny. Some, like the baby in this song, would make their living as food distributors, others in scrap metal. For my father, it was textiles. And now, here's Judy Bressler singing Raisins and Almonds. In the base of the Mikdash, in a winkel cheder, sits the Almane Bastion alein. Ir ben yachero, yidele, oi vikzi keseder, und singt im zum schlafen, Ali de So Abraham Goldfaden peddled his new product, Yiddish theater, to the Jewish people of Romania. 
but Yiddish theater hadn't sprung up in a total vacuum. The Purim Spiel, or Purim Play, dramatizing the biblical events that begot the festive Jewish holiday, had been around for centuries. Dramatizing any other part of Jewish history or culture, however, was entirely new. But Yiddish theater was part of a larger movement called Haskalah, or the Jewish Enlightenment, which sought to enlist the masses of Eastern European Jews to emancipate themselves from isolation and ignorance by means of secular education. Soon the word of Yiddish theater traveled across the border to the unique Russian city of Odessa. Or, as the titles of later books have described Odessa, City of Thieves, City of Dreams, City of Rogues and Schnorrers. Шаланды полные кефали из Минсфыш В Одессу Костя привозил И все бендюжники вставали Когда, Алик, Зухшин, ну? Когда в пивную он входил У моря предо мной Одесса, город мой Но с песней встречают И с песней провожают Одесса, мама, милый город мой Ах, Одесса Жемчужина у моря Ах, Одесса Ты знала много горя Ах, Одесса Родной жемчужный край Живи, моя Одесса Живи и процветай Ах, Одесса Ах, Одесса Ах, Одесса Родной жемчужный край Живи, моя Одесса Живи и процветай Все Among the residents in this city of Schnorrers and Starkers was young Jacob Adler. He fit in well with his raffish hometown. 
this future great tragedian of the Yiddish theater was, as an adolescent, a boxer. The English translation of his nickname from that period was Jake the Fist. After serving in the Russian army, he was at loose ends. He took a job with the newspaper and spent his nights at nearly every cafe, wine cellar, and bordello in the city. And yet, there was an emptiness. Something was lacking. I was restless, ill at ease, blindly seeking a place where my soul could find peace. And then, one day, as I sat in the editorial office of the Odessa Messenger reading about the war, my attention was caught by a notice. Reading it, my heart began to beat fast, the blood rushed to my head, and I sprang to my feet. Plainly, in black and white, I read that in Bucharest, Romania, a company of actors was playing Yiddish theater. I looked again. No, I have not dreamed it. Yiddish theater. The language is Yiddish. The play's Yiddish. The actor's Yiddish. I read further. The troupe is under the directorship of the poet Abraham Goldfaden. Not only was he not dreaming, he knew one of Goldfaden's actors, a man named Rosenberg. From joy I became another person. I had a goal, a purpose in life. I was determined to bring the Yiddish theater to Odessa. Finally, after endless effort, I discovered Rosenberg's whereabouts. I wrote to him. He answered. A lively correspondence sprang up between us. I assured him a Yiddish theater would have success in Odessa. In letter after letter, Adler painted a rosy picture until Rosenberg finally decided to leave Romania and come to Odessa with a colleague named Spivakovsky. Adler and his friends were beside themselves with joy. The great day finally came. Rosenberg and Spivakovsky were on their way, and we gathered at the railway station to meet them. When Rosenberg got off the train, it became evident that Odessa was the right destination, but not for the reason Adler had anticipated. In the midst of all this, Rosenberg took me aside. Yankala, I need money, he said. Things are going well with you, so share with a brother, eh? The mask dropped. His eyes confessed the truth. You think we did well there, in Romania? We hungered, brother. We hungered, Spivakovsky and I. Adler was greatly dismayed. But Rosenberg proceeded to audition would-be actors. Adler continues. The day came when we gathered for our first rehearsal. A whole crowd gathered at the open window, laughing and applauding. Everyone asked for a song, a dance. Said Rosenberg, Gentlemen, we are no wine cellar entertainers, no folk singers and clowns. You will have to pay money to see us. We are actors, artists. He went outside among the crowd. He came back, a broad smile on his lips. Money had changed hands. All was well again. Was it the truth, he exclaimed, radiant with happiness? They gave us money even before they saw us. That's theater. At the first performance, a Goldfaden knockoff, the paying customers went nuts, as they had in Yassi. Rosenberg, Spivakovsky, and Adler, now one of the actors, staged more Goldfaden plays and took them on the road to the provincial towns around Odessa. And so Yiddish theater had now gained a foothold in both Romania and Russia. But just as the new troupe was gaining momentum, along came the cataclysmic events following February 28, 1881. On that date, Tsar Alexander II was assassinated and the Jews immediately became the scapegoats. The Russian government now instituted a series of pogroms, a Russian term for devastations, targeting Jews. House burnings, beatings, theft, massacres of men, women, and children, Tsarist police were brutal. It was time for yet another new chapter in that old, old story, the Diaspora. Ja, 
euch leben. Es ritt auf ihr die Schrinne, lehr mir so nah sein Leben. Mir kommt es dick, so Menschenblick, darf mir auf Zuris. Ha Gubernate, darf mir nicht der Käse auf Kapures. Ha, es ist gib, sing schon alle mit. Leben soll Kolumbus, trink wieder Lach, Lach, Haim. Leben soll Kolumbus, von dem Land, dem Naim. Zeit sehr verrieben, gelebt nicht in die Trumbus. Schreit schön, leben soll Kolumbus, leben soll Kolumbus. The lyric for the 1915 song Leben Zal Columbus was written by Boris Tomaszewski, one of the greatest figures of the Yiddish theater. His family had left Kiev for New York in the aftermath of the 1881 pogroms when he was 12 years old. The next year, Tomaszewski was working at a typical low-end job on the Lower East Side, rolling cigarettes, when he heard a co-worker talking about the stage shows of Abraham Goldfaden, which were then playing in London. Do you know what this Momser did next? Okay, Momser has several meanings not all of them complimentary, but I'm using it in the admiring way you see on screen. Clever, ingenious, resourceful, and especially a very bright child. All right, a man, since Tomaszewski was 13 and had thus celebrated his bar mitzvah when the following events took place. First, he persuaded a wealthy saloon owner of his acquaintance to pay for members of Goldfaden's troupe to sail from London and present Yiddish theater in New York for the first time ever. Second, he convinced the man to rent a hall for them to perform in. Third, he made a case for filling out the acting company by hiring local talent, namely himself. No, Tomaszewski was certainly not intimidated by his Russian Jewish elders, but German Jews? That was a different story. German Jews, the proud immigrants identified as our crowd in the title of a best selling 1967 book, had come to the U.S. in an earlier wave of immigration. They were less than pleased to see hordes of their Russian co religionists wash up on American shores. The Germans were wealthier and more cultured than the Russians and were desperately trying to blend in with the affluent Gentiles of New York by forging a more genteel kind of Judaism. The presence of scruffy, orthodox Jewish peasants reminding Protestants of their own otherness would not help matters one bit. They heard about the plan to present Yiddish theater in New York and they were aghast. And so one day, a week into rehearsals, a man stomped in and asked to see the manager. The actors all looked at Boris. The man told Boris to report to the immigrant committee the following morning, where the most imperious member of the committee addressed Tomaszewski, who had brought two older actors with him for support. Are you the artists who are going to perform at Turn Hall? Yes. Is it true in the play there's a peddler named Hatzmach who swindles a girl? Yes. Is there a scene where a Jewish woman, Grandma Yachne, burns down a house? Yes. You came to America to portray Jewish thieves, Jewish arsonists? What could he say? The man continued, You'd better not perform your Yiddish play with Hatzmach and Grandma Yachne. If you don't obey us, within 24 hours we will send you away from America. 
We will send you back where you belong, on a cattle boat. Thoroughly cowed, young Boris and his colleagues staggered back to their benefactor's saloon and teary-eyed told their story. To their astonishment, the saloon keeper and his customers all burst into laughter. The saloon keeper spoke. You should also be laughing. No one can do anything to you here. Not even the President of the United States. Lebensall Columbus. Put on your play and be successful. And so Tomaszewski and his cohorts kept rehearsing, even hiring a 20-voice choir, a 24-piece orchestra, and putting up billboards announcing Abraham Goldfaden's operetta Koldunya, featuring the international star Mirla Kranzfeld. By opening night, the Lower East Side was all a buzz. The immigrants poured into Turn Hall and filled every seat in the house. These were people who had never before been to a theater. The atmosphere was electric with anticipation. Here's how Stefan Canfer describes what happened next. The first notes of the overture sounded. The actors took their places. Boris routinely counted heads and came up short. Mirla Kranzfeld, the female lead, was missing. He ran to her dressing room. It was dark. He knew that she lived nearby, signaled the orchestra to strike up the overture again, bolted out the door, and ran to her apartment. He found her with a cloth tied around her head. Kranzfeld, what happened? Why are you sitting there? Come on! Dramatically, the star complained that she was in agony. Her head throbbed, her teeth hurt, her throat was sore. Boris yelled, Boris begged, but Kranzfeld wouldn't budge. Boris ran back to the theater, where the audience, tired of hearing the overture, was stamping and whistling. What could he do, this momser, this young man who got things done? The operetta began, the first Yiddish performance in America, Boris recorded. I played Mirla's part. And so the great Tomaszewski began his illustrious theatrical career in drag. But at least he saved the evening from total disaster. The tavern owner, however, had seen enough of show business. He pulled out as a backer, and the troupe folded. What had been wrong with Kranzfeld? In Yiddish, the word for her condition was unterkäufen. In English, that translates to bribed. That's right. The immigration committee, unable to frighten Tomaszewski and his colleagues into canceling the play, paid off the star instead. Furthermore, in gratitude to Kranzfeld's husband for having persuaded his wife to betray her fellow artists, the committee brought him a business, a soda water stand on a busy street corner. And that's the glorious story of the first Yiddish theater performance in America.
Why had Jacob Adler avoided New York for all these years? Because other Yiddish actors after the 1882 Tomaszewski debacle had already staked out this turf. But by 1889, the coast, at last, was clear and his reputation was made so he could be welcomed properly. I returned to America in the spring of 1889. This time, I came with pomp and parade. If my chariot was not hung with flags and trophies of my triumphs in Europe, it was greeted on every side by posters screaming in huge letters that the great eagle of the Yiddish stage had flown to the shores of America. The nickname the great eagle sprang from the fact that Adler means eagle in German, although, after reading this quote, it should have been the great ego. Anyway, Adler chose to make his New York City debut with a triumph from his palmy London days. And fell flat on his face. Or, to put it more inelegantly and in Yiddish, on his tochas. What had happened? Adler had underestimated the unsophisticated Russian Jews of the Lower East Side. His London reputation was as an interpreter of tragedy, but thinking the audience couldn't handle that, he opened with a farce. The audience hissed. The manager told them at intermission that he had never seen Adler before. Who knew that he was a third-rate actor? Adler got the message. He picked himself up, dusted himself off, and started all over again, with serious drama. His audience loved it. Tragedy they wanted, tragedy they would get. Adler would go right to the top. But with a twist. Seeking stronger dramatic material, Adler met with Jacob Gordon, a recent Russian immigrant, a political activist, an intellectual, and a writer. Adler brought Gordon a German play and told him, Here's a ready-made subject. Perhaps you can do something with it for the Yiddish theater. But Gordon refused with a dismissive gesture. If I write a play for you, it will be a Yiddish play, not a German play with Yiddish names. Gordon was a larger-than-life figure who was contemptuous of the shun he saw on Second Avenue. He admired the realistic dramas of Ibsen, and he saw no reason why Yiddish theater couldn't be as modern and revolutionary. He wrote a four-act drama for Adler entitled Siberia, then a second play. He was just getting warmed up. For his third play, Gordon determined to tackle Shakespeare, specifically King Lear. The great English actor Henry Irving had just had a huge success as Lear in London, but Gordon refused to write a mere translation with Yiddish names. He reimagined Lear as David Moishelas, a successful businessman with three daughters, in a totally new play he called A Yiddish King Lear. Adler's actors all advised him against doing it. You're a leading man, they reminded him. Who wants to see you play a wrinkled geezer? Me, said Adler. I want to play Lear. It was a huge triumph when it opened in 1893 and changed the direction of Yiddish theater, which was, after all, still in its infancy. As was the audience, so childlike that it often didn't separate the actor from the part he was playing. Sometimes, theatergoers would yell advice to the characters. At one performance, a man called out, My dear Yonkel, Yiddish for Jacob, My dear Yonkel, that daughter of yours, that evil woman, you see now that you won't get anything to eat from her today. She truly has a stone instead of a heart. Spit on her, Yonkel, and come to me. My wife will give you a wonderful dinner. Come, Yonkel, let her choke that awful woman, your daughter. Come to me. But the Yiddish theater audience was being educated, and for a time, the serious would coexist side by side with the shund. The success of a Yiddish King Lear whetted Adler's appetite to take on another great Shakespearean role. Who else but the most infamous Jew in all of literature, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice? Shylock had been portrayed as an out-and-out -out villain in the anti-Semitic culture of Elizabethan England, 
and illustrations of Shylock characterized him that way up to the present day. Adler depicted Shylock the same way, but as he kept playing the role, his Jewish perspective took over. His portrayal evolved to a man whose better nature was overcome by a desire for revenge, and then, finally, to a man who operated not from revenge, but from pride. It was a revelation. Maybe Shakespeare wasn't a Jew hater after all. A friend begged Adler to repeat his performance on Broadway. Adler, you owe it to the Gentiles. Let them see how a Jew plays Shylock. Adler accepted the challenge and left his Second Avenue comfort zone. In an historic 1903 Broadway production, the whole cast performed in English except for Adler, who spoke his dialogue in Yiddish. It was a sensation. Yiddish theater, this parochial attraction on the Lower East Side that had been flourishing for little more than a decade, had reached the mainstream. Bessie's last name was no coincidence. She met Boris when he was 18 and she was 14, and they married four years later. Boris taught her to act, and they became hugely successful together, the first couple of the golden age of Yiddish theater. People would follow them in awe as they walked along Second Avenue. Women would throw themselves at the handsome young Boris, he of the resonant voice and the shapely legs. That was a huge problem for Bessie, and an irresistible opportunity for Boris, and would ultimately destroy their marriage. But before that, there was a popular series of plays that Boris wrote and produced that he and Bessie starred in, and that the Lower East Side Jews couldn't get enough of. They were all about greenhorns, the newly arrived immigrants, and reflected the challenges that audience members were facing in their daily lives in their quest to assimilate into this strange and wonderful country 
all the while maintaining their essential Jewishness, Das Pintala Yud. You may recall that Dus Pintala Yid was the title of the well-known poem that Goldfaden recited, which got him in so much trouble in Yassi. Well, Das Pintala Yud was also the title of the most popular song associated with Tomaszewski. Like Bessie's last name, this was no coincidence either. However it was spelled in English, and the English spelling of Yiddish words is, believe me, all over the place, this phrase was a critical component of the Jewish culture of the time. It was actually a play on words. Yud, or Y in English, is the tiniest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Pintala is the Yiddish word for small, and sounds like the word Yid, a Jewish person. So Das Pintala Yid meant the tiny and irreducible, but essential and indefinable spark of Jewishness in the soul of every member of the tribe. Sounds inspiring, but the lyrics of Das Pintala Yid are hardly that. They're about suffering, torment, torture, libel, and in spite of all these trials, keeping the spark of Jewishness alive. Oi! So let's hear this song without seeing the translation. But if you can read Yiddish, be my guest. Let's see a brief and damaged piece of rare film footage panning the street scene toward the front of one of the primary theaters of the Yiddish district in its glory days, the National Theater on 2nd Avenue. Tomaszewski and Adler were huge presences on this terrain, and both were greatly rewarded. Jacob Adler built a theater, the fittingly named Grand Theater, since Adler was the source of high culture. As the purveyor of Schund, Boris aptly and contrastingly made his home base at the People's Theater. Now firmly ensconced as the twin kings of 2nd Avenue, Adler and Tomaszewski were the ones to see if you wanted the Yiddish play you'd written to get on stage. That was, sadly and ironically, the position Abraham Goldfaden found himself in in 1907. He had been the father of Yiddish theater a mere 30 years earlier, but that was long ago and far away. He was now passé, his plays dated and unpopular. But Goldfaden was still the man he was back then, the outsider who yearned for the spotlight. He had gravitated to New York where the action was, but no one sought him out. Desperate, he took his old play, Ben Ami, to Tomaszewski and begged for a professional reading with experienced actors. How could Boris refuse the father of Yiddish theater? There was one other glorious literary name from the past and a distant country who longed to be a part of this miraculous Second Avenue metamorphosis, Sholem Alechem. Sholem Alechem had started writing in 1883 and became a household name just as Russian Jews were abandoning their households. The pogroms finally pushed him into leaving Russia in 1905. He relocated in London and tried to figure out what to do next. His huge reputation among his former countrymen made America seem a very lucrative and desirable destination. He sent off a letter to Jacob Adler in which he offered to write a play for him. After the author arrived in America and was praised at a testimonial dinner as the Jewish Mark Twain, Adler signed on. Sholem Alechem started writing. 
Not to be outdone, Boris Tomaszewski jumped on the bandwagon and commissioned Shalom Aleichem to write a play for him, too. What a different reception greeted the Jewish Mark Twain than would be accorded the father of Yiddish theater later that year. But after having grudgingly consented to a reading of Goldfaden's old script, Tomaszewski found to his surprise that the play still worked. He agreed to stage it. Goldfaden considered himself fortunate. Sholem Aleichem had enjoyed far more flattering treatment earlier that year. Adler and Tomaszewski were racing each other to be the first to debut their Sholem Aleichem play. The matter was settled when they both agreed to a premiere on the same night. The author would spend the first half of the evening at one play and the second half at the other. Both audiences and mainstream critics were delighted by what they saw, but left-wing critics were not. Sholem Aleichem's nostalgic plays about the old days in Russia were irrelevant to the current intellectual agenda, addressing the problems of living in the United States. Both plays were panned in the major Yiddish newspaper, The Forward, and they folded quickly. The Sholem Aleichem bubble blew away, and with it the author's dreams of making a fortune in America. His health started failing, and he died nine years later, impoverished and unproduced. But at least he got a lot of respect at his funeral. Comparable respect for his writing, in a theatrical context, would have to wait another 48 years. When Goldfaden's play Ben Ami opened in December of 1907, the audience loved it too. Encores, a roar of applause at the end, flowers bestowed upon the author, and then a thank you speech by an exhilarated Goldfaden. Whatever the left wing critics thought proved to be immaterial. Stefan Kanfer. He walked down 2nd Avenue to his apartment, clutching the bouquet. Swinging open the door of the flat, he shouted, Paulina, Paulina, they gave me laurel wreaths. I'm not senile, Paulina. I'm not senile. The moment was so sweet, he insisted on savoring it for the next five nights. At each performance, he laughed and cried and took bows from his box seat. On the fifth evening, he experienced some discomfort and pain in the chest. He walked home slowly. That night... He died in his sleep. Okay, as I mentioned at the start, some of you may not have been there for it. Um, I conceived of this as a two-act presentation, and so I uh, asked if I could uh, it have a little interruption at the intermission so we don't just go into the, the second act. So for just a couple of minutes, I thought I'd show you what's behind me, uh, my bookcase, including four uh, of the books that I relied on particularly uh, for this presentation, including 
uh, Stephen Canfer's book. I just read on Wikipedia that he passed away at 85 in, 19, in 2018. But this book was invaluable to me. Some people say it's not as accurate as other accounts of Yiddish theater, but it reads fabulously. And uh, uh, the drama was all there. And so I took it there, including on page 100, that wonderful quote about how uh, Goldfaden died and uh, nobody could have written a more emotionally satisfying finale. And so what could I do but take it as my first act finale? Okay, uh, that's our little palate cleansing intermission. I will now get on to act two. I uh, hope you all are enjoying it and stay with me and I will mute, stop my video and start my screen share again. And who was the new star who would provide the essential spark, Das Pintele Yud? Who was Das Pintele Yud, this new giant of the Yiddish theater? Just how Pintele was this Yid? How about four feet eight inches tall? Molly Pecan was a tiny dynamo from Philadelphia who performed almost as soon as she was out of her cradle. Well, that's abyssal exaggerated. Her mother let her go on stage when she was six. She played in vaudeville, speaking in English, but being a young performing filly in Philly was quickly too confining for Molly. As a young teen, she quit school and joined an act with three older women, that's her seated in front, and started touring the country. They got all the way out to San Francisco, then headed back east, ending up in Boston at the time of the tragic flu epidemic of 1918. All the theaters were dark except for one, a seedy old house in a bad part of town that staged Yiddish shows for tiny audiences. Molly asked the manager of the company why the city hadn't closed them down too. He replied, because nobody knew we were open. The manager who was also the producer, director, prompter, and general referee of the company, 
was an unusual man named Jacob Kalich. In Poland, he had been a rabbinical student as a teen when he befriended some actors in a Yiddish theater troupe and loaned them his ceremonial robe for a costume. As an Orthodox Jew, he had never seen theater before, but when he saw how his robe was being used, he left the rabbinical school to join the troupe. Eventually, he stowed away on a ship to America and found his way to Boston, where Molly found him. He was bowled over by her talent and the challenge, making this remarkable little performer into a star. He decided to do exactly that, not in vaudeville, but in Yiddish theater. However, the Second Avenue theater managers in New York weren't buying. So Jacob determined to build up Molly the same way Jacob Adler had become marketable in America, by conquering Europe first. After he married his star, of course. After two years of triumphant touring in Europe, in which Jacob wrote and directed all her vehicles and usually played opposite her, Molly came into New York with a built-in reputation from all the rave reviews in letters from relatives in the old world. As Adler's friend Rosenberg might have said, the people lined up and paid their money before they even saw her. Her first Second Avenue show in 1923, Yankala, was a smash hit, as she was to do many times because of her diminutive stature and cute face, she played a boy. Her father in this picture? That was Jacob. And so Molly Pecan established herself at the Second Avenue Theater and became such a big attraction that the theater would be renamed for her in 1931. Just a couple of blocks away, the National Theater competed for the light entertainment audience, also with a fresh new face. Aaron Lebedev, a Russian performer well into his 40s, came to America and became a Yiddish theater star overnight in 1920. He was such a hit that he was featured in show after show, as you can see from the long list of his vehicles throughout the decade. Like Pecan, he was skilled at singing as well as comedy. He wrote some of his own songs, including one that became extremely popular, a salute to a country he had never played. What country? In the name of Goldfaden's ghost, I'll give you one guess. Divena mola landa zi se a fine. Divena mola landa zi se Vou dos rádios e lhes do crigo A mamalígale, a pastromale, a carnatzale E na gleise ele vai na rua Aí no rumínio é nisso do guito Finquim daí que se fez benito Vai em trinco mani baral Um e for baixo para ficar de caval Ai diga diga dam diga 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 dam Ai diga diga dam diga diga dam Ai diga diga dam diga 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 dam Ai diga diga dam diga diga dam Aí no Romênia e isso dorgido, fim que exorgo um beijo bonito Vai em trinco, pois bem que tem esperto, me far baixo da castra web Ai, diga, diga, dam, diga, 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 dam Ai, diga, diga, dam, diga, diga, dam Ai, diga, diga, dam, diga, 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 dam Ai, diga, diga, dam, diga, diga, dam Oi, wie gewaltig wär mich schien, ich lieb nur Brinse, Mama Lee, ich tanz so freisig bis der Stelle, wenn ich es am Batlagele sing, ma, da irli tam, 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 ai, Susanna, ha, ich muss besser gerne sein, ai, ich verge nichts, nur Rumänen schwein. Die Rumänen trinken Wein und essen Mama Lee, und wer sich kies sein eigen Wab, jener ist mich schie, halt, sein, sa, da irli tam, bu, bu, Ta ili tam, zing zing, ta ili tam, pa pa, ta ili tam Ai, se zama ka, i vos besser gerne zai Ai, e fergi nignis nor, rumeni shvai Ai, tja ro, tja, 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 tja Ai, digi digi dam, digi 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 dam, dai digi digi dam, tja tja Ye kompir kom 
Ich in das Mädel aber bloß sag ich sie will nicht nur sie los hat in diese Kischen ist am Moid wenn sie all sechzen wenn der Kisch dann alte Moid hebt sie uns zu krächzen set tam dil di tam set set di tail di tam set ai es ist am Machai was besser kann es sein ai ihr Vergnügen ist nur mein tu tja ha 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 So both the National and Second Avenue theaters were spoken for through the rest of the 1920s. What wasn't spoken for, or rather spoken in, were movie theaters. But on a cataclysmic day in October of 1927, uptown at the Warner's Theater, all that changed forever. The jazz singer starring Al Jolson was, of course, the first talking movie, and it was a sensation. But when you get past the noise of the technical achievement, when you focus on the film itself, what was the story about? Let's set the scene. Here's how the film opened. So the most significant film in Hollywood history was set on the Lower East Side and opened with establishing shots of the neighborhood. But that music which is older than civilization? Surely they didn't mean hurdy-gurdy tunes like East Side, West Side. No, they meant the music that's the climax of the picture. When the jazz singer returns to his father's synagogue on Yom Kippur, to chant Kol Nidre. Here's Al Jolson, a real-life cantor's son from the world's first soundtrack. But Kol Nidre wasn't the only Jewish music in The Jazz Singer. Another pivotal musical moment in the film was a song created by another cantor's son. Irving Berlin's recent hit, Blue Skies, was sung by Jolson's character. Blue skies, smiling at me, nothing but blue skies do I see, oh don't know. In his fascinating book, Funny, It Doesn't Sound Jewish, how Yiddish songs and synagogue melodies influenced Tin Pan Alley, Broadway, and Hollywood, author Jack Gottlieb compares Blue Skies to Raisins and Almonds, showing similarities in parts of each tune. As Variety's headline screamed, the jazz singer started a revolution in Hollywood as the studios converted to talkies. But the jazz singer cast its long shadow over Second Avenue as well. Assimilation, declining immigration, and now talkies. Yet another nail in the coffin of Yiddish theater. Yiddish films started being made, and the focus of many playgoers turned toward the movies. But before our story turns from the stage to the cinema, let's look at two other significant factors in New York's Yiddish theater scene in the 1920s.
So the Cantor's Son, made in 1937, gave support to Artef's dim view on the triviality of American life. And it also introduced a new star to the ranks of Yiddish movie performers, the amusingly and euphoniously named Moisha Oisher, who in real life experienced yet a third, and far less pleasant, variation on the basic story of the jazz singer and the Cantor's Son. Moisha Oisher how can I use anything less than his full name, was born in Russia and was, wait for it, a Cantor's son. He emigrated to Canada as a teen and eventually ended up in Yiddish theater and then in film. Endowed with a magnificent voice, he yearned to have a career in the synagogue as well as in the cinema. <laughs> He signed on to conduct high holiday services at the First Romanian American Congregation on Rivington Street in the heart of the Lower East Side. The showbiz Bible, Variety, reported what happened next. Serious rumpus followed, with a lot of squawking and many cancellations from the synagogue membership, etc., plus a few open catcalls during the services. But in real life, as opposed to real life, the transitions went smoothly. Here's the scene in The Cantor's Son where he makes his debut as an entertainer, joined by his real-life wife, Florence Weiss. If Moisha Oisher rode on his old dreams into Bells in The Cantor's Son, Molly Pican rode on a hay wagon into a genuine old world town in her first sound film, Yiddle with His Fiddle or Yiddle Mitten Fiddle. That's because director Joseph Green shot the movie not in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, but in Poland. As part of the ambiance of Yiddle with his fiddle, Green captured on film a rare glimpse of the Eastern European Jewish culture and its Yiddish theater actors, all of which would soon be, tragically, a thing of the past. American Yiddish theater composer Abe Elstein wrote the title song with lyrics by Molly Pecan herself. The song and the movie proved very popular. Oh, 
Well, not everywhere. Yiddel plays at a wedding where the bride is marrying a man she doesn't love. But hey, it's a wedding. As one critic of the period observed, New York's Yiddish stage seemed limited by a coterie of five librettists with a lesser number of plots, all revolving around the need for a grand wedding scene. So what scene could be more essential for a history of Yiddish theater? Let's watch a bit of The Wedding Party in Yiddel Mitten Fiddle. <laughs> The success of Yiddel Mitten Fiddle led Green to shoot another pecan picture in Poland in 1938, the last year that would be possible. Mamala finally got Molly into women's clothes, but as the little mama, the tireless housekeeper for her lazy, ungrateful siblings and father after her mother has died, Molly's optimistic character makes the best of her situation in another hugely popular pecan Elstein song. Abi Gesund was so popular that it inspired another song with almost the same name in 1940. Abi Gesund? Well, it wasn't Yiddish, it was jive, a distinctive slang that developed in Harlem in the 1930s as part of the jazz scene. 
Jive took its colorful expressions from all over the place, including the language and inflections of Jews, who were, as a group, significantly represented among jazz musicians. Let's listen to an excerpt from this curious song as performed by a popular singer of the time, Mildred Bailey. I never knew a hip cat from a square And I was called to bring down everywhere But since I went and joined a swing society Now I'm hip and filled with notoriety A very close friend of Mr. Bender A Bender Schmender A Beaker Zint I'm a chick that's in the know Three years earlier, an act at the Apollo Theater in Harlem had wowed the black crowd with not just a phrase, but a whole song in Yiddish. It was a song from a 1932 Yiddish theater show called I Would If I Could. The song had later been performed on the Jewish resort circuit in the Catskills, where entertainers Johnny and George heard it, learned it phonetically, and then introduced it at the Apollo, where it was witnessed by a young Jewish songwriter named Sammy Kahn. Kahn was a skinny little guy from the Lower East Side, but based on what he did next, he was a real macher. When he heard this Yiddish song at the Apollo, he was amazed. When the beat gets going there, it's the same as in a cartoon. The building expands and contracts. The whole theater literally starts to undulate, and you feel that this place is going to cave in. It can't handle the excitement. He shouted to his companions over the bedlam, Can you imagine what this song would do to an audience that understood the words? By me. Bei mir hast du recht, wir singen bei mir auf der Welt. Bei mir bist du Gift, bei mir hast du Ehr, bei mir bist du Teil von Geld. Viel schöne Mädchen, Yiddish theater and language may have been dying, but they sure were having one hell of a funeral. In their decomposing, they were fertilizing American culture and language, enriching it not just with songs and jive phrases, but a whole peppering of pungent words and expressions. As Yiddish theater underwent its painful, decades-long descent into oblivion, there was a lot of lamentation for the disappearance of a unique cultural institution, and there followed attempts to revive it. 
But this weeping and gnashing of teeth was so focused on what was lost that it took for granted what Yiddish theater had accomplished by the very fact of its existence. Think about it. Before Goldfaden came up with his overnight epiphany in 1876, there had never been a Jewish play as secular entertainment. There had never been a Jewish theater writer, or composer, or director, or producer, or actor, or professional entertainer. And now, look. Okay, uh, thank you all for watching. And uh, I see there are a number of uh, uh, comments in chat. Uh, I don't know uh, if there needs to be things I should answer. Uh, uh, Fran, did you wanna moderate this part or what do you think? Um, well, if, if there are any questions, people can unmute and ask you directly. That's fine. We'll That's do that. Fine. Well, let's say we'll do that for a few minutes and then uh, we'll close it out. Oh, yeah. I have a question. I have a question. May I go? Yes, please. Oh, that list at the end, the scrolling list, was that of people who had started out in Yiddish theater or was it something else? Oh, Charles, you're on mute. 
Sorry. Ah, okay. No, the, those were basically all Jewish performers. Uh, I got them from a list online. Uh, I italicized those who were who started in Yiddish theater, but basically it was the whole shebang or whole Megillah. Everybody, <laughs> yeah, everybody who uh, made their mark. And I, I put pictures next to the people that I thought uh, should be particularly noted. Yes, thank you very much. Sure. It was wonderful. It was really fun. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. I would yes. Like is, there, is there a link that we can refer some of our unfortunate fellows who didn't get to see this so they can see it later on because it was really great? Well, thank you. Uh, I guess it's going to be on for a couple of months. I don't want it to be on forever because, you know, it's my intellectual property and all that stuff. Right. I, I do have, I should uh, say in all modesty, yuck, 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 uh, over 50 of these presentations. I have a website, uh, charlestroy.com. I do my presentations uh, not just locally live in the Chicago area, but on Zoom for other um, audiences. I have, for instance, uh, four presentations in the month of July for a theater in New York. And it's on Zoom, so everybody has an opportunity to see it if you'd like. So uh, Charles, charlestroy.com? Yeah, and if you want to write me an email, it's charlestroy at comcast.net. Charles, great. Question, how come you never mentioned Sophie Tucker? Oh, she was in the list. She she was on the list. You know, the list goes by so fast that it's yeah, hard it to catch everybody. Fast, yeah. She was there. When now, you, sh you, you showed... Uh, up to 1970, is there any, is there any cont continuation? I know there is a lot of Jewish performers in Israel, but I'm talking in the diaspora. Do, do they identify themselves as Jewish performers at all, or they're try everybody tries to melt in? Well, I, I thought for the purpose of my presentation, I needed to stop in the 60s because I thought the names after that would be less well known, and uh, I didn't want to kind of dribble it out, if I may. So, what about, uh, what, 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 what about Menashe Skaldik? Wasn't he in the list? He should have been. Was he there? Uh, you know, he may have been born before 1880. Maybe that's why. Okay, uh, I I'll double check that. my list. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It was wonderful, wonderful. I, 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 can you connect what, this what to Hollywood Studios? Tina? Yeah, I'm no. sorry, one at a time. Can I'm you sure. connect this to Hollywood Studios? Connect this to Hollywood Studios? Well, I mean, of course, uh, there were uh, most of the uh, moguls in Hollywood were Jewish and they avoided uh, presentations on uh, Jewish subjects. I do have a presentation on Fiddler on the Roof and that gets into that aspect of the, the story. To the job. Did you mention the folk spina, which is still going on? Uh, I think I had that as uh, an early part in the presentation. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of stuff in here and it packs in, so uh, it may have gone by too fast, but I did mention it. Hi, I wanted to say that I am a Yiddish entertainer. I speak Yiddish and I try to run Yiddish groups as much as I can. Yes, it's sort of, you know, fading out as the Holocaust survivors uh, are, are dying off. But next week I'll be singing for the Holocaust survivors in Boca Raton. And I was given a great honor. I have only one CD. I started late in life, but I come from a Yiddish speaking family in Borough Park. And uh, my CD was put in the Yiddish archives of FAU and the University of Pennsylvania. And I love to speak and sing Yiddish. And many of the songs that you presented, I do sing, especially uh, Rajan Kismet Mandlin and, uh, and, and Abhi Gesund and all of them, which I will be doing next week, God willing. That's uh, terrific. Yes, so yes, we'll do, let's do one, uh, two more questions, please. Okay. You should be saying. I have a comment to make. Years ago, we were in Bucharest and we went to the Yiddish theater and we were told that they still put on Yiddish plays, but the majority of the actors are not Jewish. They huh. perform in Yiddish, but out of 32 actors, 
I think 21 were non-Jewish. And wow. I think that was very interesting. Yeah, I think that's you the should. same in New York City. It's the very same you, thing. Would you uh, care to speak about uh, Yiddish theater uh, post uh, the Second World War? Uh, uh, theater like the folks, Uh I'm not yeah. enough of an authority on that. If you have something to say, please go ahead. But I oh, I want to say about the folks, Bina. Sure. Um, I'm on. A, I'm not on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, the the museum. Uh, I'm sorry. The uh, uh, um, the. The, the, the Holocaust Museum, also known as the Museum of Jewish Heritage, has been performing Yiddish. That's the folks find the theater in, um, in their theater in Lower Manhattan, uh, including Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish, but any other place in Yiddish, including a revival of some of the Second Avenue uh, plays. Um, and it's really quite uh, interesting. Um, so you, you should look into that. That could be a whole other series, uh, Charles. Yes. Uh, thank you is. all for coming. Thank oh. you to Elka Goose for, for hosting for us. Oh, and thank Charles you. Troy, as well always, as very sure. enjoyable. Thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you in other things. Oh, I just sure. say one more thank thing. You. Sure. I, I see that there's a lot in the chat that maybe uh, are questions. So if you want to write to me at charlestroy at comcast.net, God knows I'm not an authority on Yiddish theater, but it looks like some of them are questions I can answer, but I don't think we want to keep going on like this. But please write me at uh, charlestroy at comcast.net. Say that more slowly. Charles what? Charles Troy, T-R-O-Y. Oh, T-R-O-Y. At comcast.net. Okay, hey, thank you all very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. I shame them, Dank. Bye, everybody. Sag is in. Sag is in, everybody. Oh, wonderful. Oh, God, you had me crying. Sag is in. Sag is in, Dallas. 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 Sag is in, if I find somebody I could speak Yiddish to, I'm, I'm like beside myself with joy. If anybody is still on, if they're interested, I happen to sing in Yiddish uh, in a group in North Carolina, and it's called magnoliaklezmer.com. And you can hear me singing a few of those songs. I'm no lover there, but uh, yeah. the Yiddish is there. The uh, yeah, Mazel Tov. Mazel Tov. <laughs> With a Lithbuck accent. So, yeah. That Lithbuck, right, that's right. Yeah, although a, a lot of the tunes are, 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 sing with a, are sung with a Galiciana accent because the rhymes sound better, uh, some of them. Like uh, git instead of nit or, or, or gut. So, yeah. you know. I, I, I find that most of the songs I really love are more than the Second Avenue songs. They're the Mordechai Gebertig songs like Yankala and uh, and uh, Rezala and 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 Moishala, my friend. Oh, they're so touching. I, you let me sing, I'll sing for you right now. I'm so happy to do it. <laughs> if I have no, one who's track, stopping you? Sing Yankala, Yankala. Sing Yankala. Shrubs a mere showing Yankala, my Die Egelach, die Schwarze, Mahachzu. A Yingele was hot, Muss noch die Mama singen, A Yingele was hot, Muss I
Ai ne rızlemen de temore. Oçte de tatek veltun her sihirsu. Ai ingele vos faksat hamet kohem. Los kansen ehter mamen netzeru. Ai ingele vos faksat hamet kohem. Los kansen ehter mamen netzeru. Ai ingele vos faksat hamet kohem. Un agenete soichar oich suhu gleich. Ai ingele akloge chosen boche. So liggen as oin nas wie in a teich. Ai ingele akloge chosen boche. So liggen as oin nas wie in a teich. Wo schlafst du nit mein kloge chosen boche. Der Weile liegst du in Wegele bei mir. Es wird kosten noch für mich und Mames zwehren. Bis wann ins wird ein Mensch verrückt und dich. Es wird kosten noch für mich und Mames zwehren. Bis wann ins wird ein Mensch verrückt. Oh, 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 oh,